relevant issues regarding next week, how we're going to conduct the Seder, because uh, it's always good. We're trying to point out to people, get your Haggadah of Pesach before Passover. I won't be able to send it, uh, send one to you. Now, the mail service already over. There's someone off or order quoting uh, Haggadah of Pesach today. I can't mail it tomorrow because it's Friday. And maybe I'll be able to mail it on Sunday, but certainly not on Monday. And even if I mail it on Sunday, he's not going to get it before Passover starts. So if you need a copy of Agadada Pesach, contact me directly, or I could send you to people in Jerusalem who might be able to you up. Uh, so let's see it on the inside. Interestingly enough, the Rambam talks about Luchos Korban Pesach, but doesn't tell you how you should go about eating it. He had already mentioned it before in Zmanim, in Hilchos Chametz and Matzah. So let's look over here. Hope you remember how you did uh, Passover in years past, because now we're going to start comparing and contrasting. Okay, so there's a there's quite a few things over here. Ram says here, Sidura Siyath Mitzvot Helu Beleil Chamishasar Kapu. Here's how you do all these mitzvahs on the night of the fifteenth of Nisan. Was he referring to? Well, there's Eden Matzah, there's Moror, there's Korban Pesach, there's the things that Chazal threw in, like four cups of wine, Karpas and Haroses. The midst of Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, Halel, there's quite a lot. But kos echad echad. At the beginning, we bring one cup for everybody. Why everybody? We saw that normally, on most Sabbaths and holidays, it's sufficient for one person to recite the Kiddush for as many people who are listening, right? One one cup for many. He is mutziat to rabbi midecho He could discharge his obligation. But in this case, everybody has to drink. And also, we saw in weeks past that normally the Rambam says a person is supposed to have a revius in the cup. But the revius itself, that's the minimum uh, volume of the wine. That itself could be only twenty five percent wine. Whereas in Passover, this is more concentrated. He starts with the revius of the wine, and then he could dilute it up to about 300 ml. I'm assuming the Revius is 75 ml or so. Okay, if you're Rav Chaim Noah, so it's 86 ml as a starting point. So you're already dealing with a larger quantity of wine than usual, and everybody has to have their own cup. And he recites the blessing, that's the first blessing of the Kiddush. And he says, the Kiddush Hayom. Kiddush Hayom is one of two texts. It's either the Kiddush for Lele Yom Tov, the night of a Yom Tov, or it's the combined Kiddush of Shabbat and Yom Tov. And the Rambam is very exact because that is one bracha. The Zman is a third bracha. Bor Piragafen is one bracha, Kiddush is another bracha, and the third bracha is what's called Shechianu, Wishotheh, and then he drinks it. And the Rambam says, Chayavim Ba Of course, you have to lean. Years past, I pointed out that the rabbi holds like the Rav Ya, who says that nowadays, it's been this case, we do not eat on these special leaning couches and bring trays to the table. Everybody gets their own personal tray. That's what the Shulchan is called. Instead, we sit at tables with chairs, and we often have armchairs. We eat in the European style. So he tells people not to try to lean. I pointed out that really no one ends up doing Haseva at their tables. No one ends up doing this mitzvah. Either you hold like the Raviyah and you don't even attempt to do it and you're not doing it, or you're like those who are trying to lean over. This isn't an armchair, by the way. This is a chair in the base matters that doesn't have arms. They're trying to lean over with a pillow and drink like this, but Lama said they're not accomplishing anything. So it's just a distinction between those who attempt and fail and those who do not attempt. But bottom line, no one succeeds at accomplishing this anymore, unless you actually do like those Rambam miss and you get yourself a bunch of couches and you sit around, you know, in the living room, uh, you use a coffee table, I guess, to hold old things. And I've seen people do a sort of Seder like that. Very interesting. Just try to use a fork and knife when you're leaning in like that. And suddenly you realize, okay, I better go to the table. Okay. And then he drinks it. And then he says the blessing on the Tilat Yadayim and he washes his hands ceremoniously. Uh, wait a minute, in my Haggadah, I found that it doesn't say that. You're right, it doesn't say that. A lot of Haggadahs, a lot hold that for what's called Kadesh Urchatz, the Urchatz part, it's without a blessing. Okay? And secondly, the Rambam, Kedarko, and other places, points out that 
mitzvot of Erlas Yaton. Really, you're supposed to say the bracha before you do the mitzvot. So the Rambam holds many times, you're supposed to first say the bracha all the tiyas yadayim, and then actually wash your hands. And indeed, you've probably seen people do that recently. I have a little bit of a problem. My uh, people have caught me saying the bracha afterwards. One, I grew up like that. Two, I still have this situation, I guess, in my own uh, my own house, the first sink I encounter every day is within the bathroom. So I can't say the tiyas yadayim. I do tiyas yadayim there. I try to sometimes. I don't want to leave my room and wake up all the children, etc. I try to keep very quiet and first one up in the morning. So sometimes I don't have a choice. I have to wash and see I'm in a place where I can't say the bracha. So oh, please don't uh, don't jump on me for that one. But either way, here the Rambam is uh, staying consistent. You're supposed to say the bracha, you're supposed to wash your hands. And uh, we've mentioned that in other Haggadahs. The standard Maxwell House and Archibald Haggadah don't have a bracha over here. And then, who's them? Mavin. There are those who are supposed to bring uh, a table that is set. In this case, okay, um, yeah, Yushami has a third option, saying brachas during the mitzvah. Yeah, during the mitzvahs also. But over la siyathan. doesn't mean that, why didn't they say before? So over, it's like as he's doing it, but certainly not afterwards. Ramam holds that once you've done a mitzvah, you can't, if you're not still osik in the mitzvah, so you can't, you can't say the bracha anymore. So they bring him a table, shulchan aruch. In this case, it means a tray, okay? The tray, and this is, that doesn't mean a book, a volume of Shulchan Aruch by Rabbi Yosef Karo. It means they're bringing actual food, okay? It has to be on the table, it's set up. This would be the equivalent of the Seder plate. In the Rambam's classic view, which is following that as described in the Talmud, the Seder plate isn't a ceremonious object which has, you know, a piece of chazeris and some karpas and some uh, arosis on it. It's his actual tray of the food he is going to be eating. That's his personal meal, okay? It's like a, on the airplane or a TV dinner. That's what it's supposed to be. What does it have? A lot of maror, riarakacher. It should have one of the bitter herbs and a different vegetable that's not maror. Umatsa. Notice the Rambam doesn't call karpas ever. Karpas is just a minhag. And it's an easy way to remember by the simanim. But really, for this alternate vegetable, you could use anything you want that's not maror. It doesn't. It could even be uh, you know, cucumbers. We eat cucumbers so often here that it's not going to be anything special, but technically speaking, in a pinch, you could use a cucumber, a grabi, even a carrot, even say it's not green. So he brings the maror and the arak and the matzo, unleavened bread, haroseth, which he described already, gufo shal keves hapesach, musar chagiga shal yom arvasar, and meat. Gufo shal keves hapesach means the whole body of the pesach. Technically speaking, if they have a big enough group and there's enough pesach to go around, they would bring in the whole lamb on the platter, I guess, and some meat from the Chagiga of the Abarasar. Vazmanazeh, nowadays, was Manazeh, Ram saying Zman Hagalut, when you don't have corn Pesach, Levin al Shulchan, Shnei Minibasar, two types of meat are on there, Echad Zech Lefesach, Vechad Zech Chagiga. But make sure none of them are roasted lamb. That's a halacha, and in some places, Ram says it's also forbidden if that's the local practice not to have roasted meat at all, because, uh, you know, it's, it's too much like Korban Pesach. So, when you see your standard Seder plate, which has a shank bone, and no one knows what a shank bone is, and anybody tell me what a shank bone is? Usually some sort of piece of cooked meat or chicken, whatever it is, same with a bone on it, and an egg. Those are not meant to be symbolic. Those are his portions to eat for that meal. That's what he's going to be eating. So, if you want to be doing like the Rambam, just set up your entire plate already. How much? Figure out how much harosis you're going to be using, how much maror, how much karpas, how much matzah you need, and how much meat you're going to eat. That's going to be your meal. But you could all the other things that are beyond that, like the Ram's going to say, don't go on the seder plate. If you're also going to be having some potato kugel and simis, uh, as, as it may be, or even some soup, those are kept on a separate plate. Right? So notice also he says shein mineh basar. Why didn't egg replace it? Because I guess in some places. And they couldn't find two types of meat. So they're using already the meat for the shank bone, whatever that may be. So they used a hard boiled egg. Fine. He starts with, it says, interesting language over there. He starts with saying, Why does it say start with? Because normally, if they brought bread to the table, matzah is just unleavened bread, what should he be doing? Well, he washed his hands. And with Ntilas Yadayim, normally the process is he should start with the bread. But in this case, he's not. He's going to be avoiding the bread. That washing the hands was entirely for this vegetable. 
He's going to say the blessing upon eating the vegetable. He takes the vegetable, not the maror, the other vegetable, dips it in the haroses, and eats an olive's worth, the minimum amount. Also over here, notice, whoa, I saw that it says salt water. Yeah, that's a that's enough, that's a different minhag. And some say vinegar instead of salt water, whatever it may be. Salt water reminds you of tears. The Rambam has no such thing. According to the Rambam, everything reading tonight, except for Korban Pesach, is to be dipped in haroses. <laughs> and this is, he's talking about the leader, everybody's to take a piece of this vegetable, dip it in the haroses, and eat it. Every single one. Everybody has to eat. Can't say, well, he's... He's discharging my obligation for me. That's very interesting. For Pesach, everything around Pesach, every single person has to drink his own cup. None of this, he's going to do it for me. Even technically Haggadah. So a person can read it, so other people are listening, that works. But they should listen. They're part of the process. One person to, to say it, one person to listen. Uh, you'll excuse my allergic reaction over here. But then they remove the Shulchan. Okay, eating's over. Move it away. Okay. In front of the person who's actually going to be leaving this, he's the Korea Gada. They take away the Seder plate. Why? So the children will ask. And then they pour the second cup, getting ready for the next stage. So the next stage is going to conclude with a blessing on the wine. So here's they're getting it ready. And this is where the son starts asking the questions. It doesn't necessarily have to be the son, like the Ramam says. He doesn't have children around, so let others ask him, or his wife. Okay, that's what it says. I've seen satyrs. It was actually very cute. So a really old couple, quite a few years, sit at a satyr table, just the two of them, and conduct the satyr in this way. Okay. They had children, by the way, just to, I guess that that was their thing. They wanted to be, you know, have a nice, quiet satyr. The Omer Akure, and the one reading Nagata says, who is this this child? He says, Manish Tana Lazami Koliloth. How is this night different from all the other nights? Shabakoloth Ainanu Matbili Mafiu Palmakath. Is that the first question? Okay. Fine. Does, does the order Ma'akiv? In this case, probably not. He says, We only dip our food once, usually. Lailzesh de Fami. Sorry, we don't even dip our food once. We don't have the ceremonial dipping. I sometimes I just eat my vegetables. I don't have to take my cucumber and put it into Harosis or salt water, as it may be. Tonight, we dunk it twice. Most nights, we eat leavened bread or unleavened bread. Yeah, most people just don't know it. I have to point out to a lot of people, a lot of things that you eat are technically matzah. You just don't realize it. You just didn't make it with the intention of keeping it kosher for Passover. But if you made uh, brownies or cookies, barekas, those are all halakhli matzah, as long as there's no water in the mix. And if there's water in the mix, if you we're able to bake it or cook it before it had a chance to rise, it's technically matzah. He's trying to say the types of poth, poth covers bread and anything, other products that are made from the five mini dagan, the five types of true grain, that's not uh, considered a, a cooked dish. Okay? It's baked properly, it has a tsura to it. So that's chametz and matzah. Well, I love that tonight, it's all, what? Kulo matzah. The only thing we're eating is matzah, unleavened types of bread. What happened to all the leavened bread? We burned it earlier today. Now there's nothing left. He continues. Uh, Most nights, we eat other vegetables. Specifically, we're eating maror. Normally, we have some zucchinis and string beans. And today, it's just lettuce. Most nights, what are we doing? We're eating meat, whichever way. We can eat stewed meat, cooked meat, roasted meat. Tonight, only roasted. Most nights, what are we doing? We're, we're eating in whichever position we're sitting, or, or we're reclining. Tonight, we're all reclining. It's a good question. How many total questions do you have here? Five. Well, let's count them. Okay. Shabachoyloth over here, one. Shabachoyloth, two. Kulo matzah. Shabachoyloth, three. Over here. Shabachoyloth, over here. Shabachoyloth. So it's not four questions. It should be five. So why is our Haggadah missing it? The answer is, Basman if you don't have Korban Pesach, Eino Mer Valayla Zeh Kulo Tzali, Shein Wanu Korban. The reason we leave this question out is because 
we don't have a korban. If we would have korban, korban Pesach, we should have the fifth question. And indeed, that's where we have in Haganara Pesach. Bubachil Bignut. And the response should begin with our disgrace. The Korean should go marry Drash Parashat or Ramiyo Vidavikula. And he continues reading until he finishes the Drash, the exposition of Aramiyo Vidavi. Rabbi Sharkey said this week, what's the Drash? Well, Aramiyo Vidavi is a passage taken from Parshas Kisava, which is all the way in Deuteronomy, near the end of the Torah. And it's a small, uh, I guess, it, it's a representation of the Passover story in a few psukim. It's the Mikrabi Kareem, what a person is supposed to say when he brings his first fruits to the temple and gives it to the Kohen, he's supposed to make, he's supposed to say this, uh, I guess, this Thanksgiving declaration. Here, we're going to say each of these verses, and then we're going to bring proof from other parts of the Torah, mostly from Exodus, and I, I guess even other parts of the Vim, to explain what the is going on here in Devarim. Excuse me. And then they bring back the table. What do you mean? They bring him back his tray. This is at the end of Magid. Why? Because now he's going to talk about the food that's on the tray. He says, Pesach Zeh. What's wrong with Sha'anu Ochlim? This corn Pesach, which we're eating. By the way, the Rambam, in all these cases, assumed what? That you have corn Pesach on the table. And then he says, and if you don't have corn Pesach, here's what you're supposed to do. Leave out this question. Or say this. Etc. If you don't bring the bring the seder plate to the table, it should have, you know, the meat of the korban pesach and the meat of the chagig on it. And if you don't have that, so bring two replacement uh, foods, two replacement meats on on the, on the plate. Mashma from the Rambam that the Rambam is looking forward to korban pesach. That's what he tells you in If you don't have korban pesach, but the avad, that's what you're supposed to do. Which surprises me. Too many people have this the wrong approach, like uh, what Paul Morris was saying. If what was it? The Jewish people in Egypt were instructed to break out of their psychological uh, servitude. What? Go get a Korban Pesach. Go prepare a lamb in front of the Egyptians' faces. That's their god. And then slaughter it and eat it and wipe its blood on the doorpost. Make a, make a show of what they did. Show that you're not intimidated by the gods of Egypt. Like we said before, the gods are conceptual. They represent the higher concept. Okay? You're slaughtering the symbol of their gods. It's like Malahavdil, what is it? Uh, burning an American flag. That's like slaughtering uh, a lamb. And by the way, that's a pretty terrible thing. You should have a little bit of Kvod Malchus. Assuming you know you live in a, in a decent country, you should show a little respect for that country's symbols and uh, also the leadership of that country. Well, the Kvod Malchus is, is a very important aspect because all demanded it. Even for the wicked, they're deserving of a certain amount of kavod malchut. Either way, that's what they did then. So it was the brave people who were willing to do Korm Pesach who merited to leave Egypt. But nowadays, what's going on? You have the people who want to bring Korm Pesach. It's in their schus that will actually have a gula. Our problem is too many of us are not willing to bring Korban Pesach. No one wants to put themselves on the line to do such a thing. So we need a lot more Jews who are willing to say, yes, I intend to do Korban Pesach. Okay. Al shem she pasach ha-makom baruchu al batei avotheni b'misraim. It's called Pesach because the Lord passed over. Okay? Pesach is a noun. Pesach, mil'el. And Pasach is a verb. It's a past tense verb. And as we know, God doesn't literally pass over. This is an anthropomorphic verb, which Unclus does not translate literally. It means God took pity on us. In Egypt, you should say to your children that day, it's the Passover offering for the Lord. And Zevach is an offering that is slaughtered. That means you're supposed to pick it up and say, and you know, show it, not just point to it. Not only that, with his hand. It says, we eat this because it's a memory of how they embittered our lives in the land of Egypt. And it says they embittered their lives. Right? The Egyptians embittered the lives of the Israelites. Notice how the Rambam is out of order here. In his own Haggadah, after this, and in our Haggadahs, it actually says the leader describes first Pesach, Matzah, and then Maror. Not Pesach, Maror, Matzah. So it's a machlokas, I guess, the order of where you should do it. It's a machlokas, the Rambam and the Rambam. Then says the Once again, lifts up the matzah, not just point to the matzah. Matzah zo shanu 
Ochlin, Al Shem Shalo, his peak, Bitsi Kamsha, Lathina Lachmitz, Ad Sniglalem, Akadosh Prochu, and Golam Miad. It's not exactly our gear. So it says here we eat this matzah because they did not allow their dough time to leaven, right, to rise in this case, uh, before the Lord appeared to them and redeemed them. And they baked the dough into cakes of matzah, the dough that they had taken out of Egypt. It says previously they grabbed their dough and ran. Uh, my daughter asked me today. They didn't put a little sourdough into the into the dough. It says they grabbed the, the mixing troughs, the kneading troughs with the dough still in it. And then they had a chance. So they got to bake it and it hadn't, it hadn't risen yet. She said, wait a minute. In the, in the old days, didn't they used to put sourdough into everything? They kept the sourdough. The first thing you do when you start kneading the dough is put a little sourdough into it so it would rise faster. They didn't do that. And the answer is no, because they had been told beforehand, get rid of your sourdough. As part of the preparations for the first Korban Pesach, before the Exodus, they had been told, Get rid of the sourdough. Where does it say that? I'll read the verse here. I hope I find it. It was a uh, pretty bad if I don't. Here, it's in the. We actually read it last week. Shivagami matzoto chelu ach byomri shon tashpistu zor mi batechem. Okay. Because whoever eats chametz will get kares. Ach by Yom Rishon. Yom Rishon doesn't mean get rid of the chametz on the first day of the festival, those seven days. It means the day before those seven days. When you and I call Korban Pesach, uh, when they call Haga Pesach, which should be called Haga Matzoth, on that day, the 14th, Yom Rishon, get rid of your sourdough. So when they're sitting there in their houses, eating the matzah that they originally been commanded to make, to eat with this lamb and with the bitter herbs, they didn't have sourdough. And in the morning, they took dough with them, but they didn't have any sourdough to put in it. So there was no way they could have leavened it. Even if they had time, they couldn't have added sourdough to get the leavening going faster. It was Manazeh Omer, and if you don't know Korban Pesach, once again, with Yavad, Pesach Sheu Avotinu Ochlim Bizman Shabbat HaMikdash Kayom. The Passover that our ancestors eat when the temple was standing. Al Shem She Pesach HaKadosh Baruch Hu Avotinu The Ramam says, adjust your gear, so. Once again, we see that we should have uh, 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 a seder with the Korm Pesach. He continues over here, and this is something that someone asked me, you know, why we a choice that we made making Korm uh, Haggadah Pesach, you could see it over here that the Rambam, it's necessary change, from because what the Rambam says here is not exact. He's expecting to understand this better. He continues, all these different words of praise, therefore it's incumbent upon us to praise God. He who has done for us and for our ancestors all these great miracles, and he took us out from servitude to freedom. And by the way, the Rambam here doesn't have that section of Kama Malot Tavot Lamakom Aleinu and Dayinu. He doesn't have that. That seems to be a later piyut, or perhaps one that was, that was not a universal minhag, so the Ram does bring, remember, unless it's a universal minhug, the Ram is not going to mention it. Although it's totally fine to add songs of praise and other texts. Remember, it's a mitzvah sapir b'tzias mitzrayim. So obviously, if you just read the Agada, you're going to finish it pretty quickly. You want to go over time, you get yourself other books of mitzrayim and other stories about the Exodus, because I'll certainly have quite a lot that you could add. And as we know, there's a, our traditional Agadas have a lot more piyutim added on to the end. No one ever said that those putim have to be saved for the end. Perhaps you can, if you need to buy time at the beginning, you could sing those putim, or you can intersperse them in the reading. Rokeach quotes Rabino Avram, that they did say that they're, yes, there were those who said it. They said at their table, but it wasn't the universal type of thing. We could look back. There are many people doing research. See what Gavriel has to say about this. He's uh, trying to keep track how the evolution of our Haggadah. Okay. And uh, he continues, it's starting with a hallelujah. And Omar Lefanov, hallelujah, 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 the Hashem. Notice there's a space here. Big Machlokas is the word hallelujah that appears in Tehillim, one word or two. If the given name is one word, but the, what is exactly here is praise the Lord. Is it two separate words? That, you know, praise the Lord, or is it one word who's, that is etymologically from the two words? This is the beginning. This is the food. These are the first two. Uh, 
paragraphs of the first two chapters, as it may be, of the Halel Hamitzri. The Chotim Baruch Atah Hashem Elokim Melchulam Asher Galanu Vigalav Tehen Mitzrayim Vigano Lailaze Lecholbo Matza Umorim. Gvazman Hazem Mosif. Here is the blessing that he's supposed to say if he has Korban Pesach. Blessed art thou, Lord, our uh, Lord, God, King of the world, who has redeemed us and redeemed our ancestors from Egypt and brought us to this night in order to eat matzah umarim. Notice that he left out Pesach. Well, what's going on over here? Maybe you should have said Pesach matzah umarim. I don't know. Then he says, there's an addition. Yes, hold on. Question. Just letting it rise loose. Surprisingly, used to make matzah. It doesn't take too long. Either. Yes, many of us have baked matzah. We just had a matzah baking today, as a matter of fact. Thank God. Here's how it goes. The man will see. Here's the addition. If he doesn't have Korm Pesach, a prayer for the future. So too, our God, God of our fathers. No, Lord, God of our, our, our God and God of our fathers. Bring us to more set times. It means holidays and pilgrimages uh, that will come upon us in peace. Uh, uh, happy in the building of your city and rejoicing in your service. And then we shall eat, or there we shall eat, of the zevachs, the feast offerings, and the psachim, the this is reference to the Chagiga and from the Paschal offerings. Whose blood shall reach the wall of your altar with favor. That means the application of blood will be done with favor, will be accepted by God. We'll thank you or we'll thank your name. On our redemption and Paduth Nafshin. What's the interesting Gula and Paduth? Two forms of redemption. That's a good thing. Hebrew language, I don't know what the nuance between the two of them is. And then he finishes, Baruch HaTo Hashem Gual Yisrael. Blessed art thou, Lord God, Redeemer of Israel, or some have Gaal Yisrael. Past tense. Now, here's my question. This, if you say this whole bracha one, that's the bracha if you don't have Korm Pesach. It's obvious that over here where the Ramah says, this is the original bracha, and here's where the Tosefis begins. This cannot be the end of the bracha. Can't just be Baruch Atah Hashem Elokim Melchulam Asher Galanu V'Galav Atin Mitzrayim V'Gan Olan Zeh Lechobo Matzo Marim Amen. No, and that says you still see Baruch Rafin. This is over here. This attachment over here, Baruch Atah Hashem Gol Yisrael, is the Chatima of this longer bracha over here. But the question is, so he's just supposed to say V'Chotim Baruch Atah Hashem Elokim Melchulam V'Gan Olan Zeh Lechobo Matzo Marim Baruch Atah Hashem Gol Yisrael. So. It's it's sort of missing. It means that, yeah, the dough starts rising about 40 minutes, or you just notice it within 40 minutes. That fits something that Rav Buch pointed out. How long does it actually take dough to rise? Really, is it 18 minutes, one mil walk, or is it a four mil walk, whatever that may be? We wanted to tie that. It takes, obviously, a lot longer, because people were mixing flour and water, saying, well, even after 20 minutes, 25 minutes, it doesn't look like it's risen in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it tastes like... It takes more than an hour to notice the signs. And that was his thing. So you have a lot more time to make your matzah. Either way, the conclusion that I, which I arrived at and was in, implied by Rav Tzuriel, at least, you know, it's, it's a decent uh, conjecture, right? Is that you don't pray for the future when you have Korm Pesach. Instead, we're going to thank Hashem for this. Okay? Rurim. And we thank God for being smechim b'vinai recha, so slim b'avotecha, okay? V'no de'alecha, al gulothinu al-pudu v'ashenu, baruch ha'tu Hashem, g'lel Yisrael. So we combine, so we cut out the part, the part that we cut out is only the part that uh, is truly fitting for when you don't have Korban Pesach, which would be this part, okay? This prayer for the future is cut out because we have Korban Pesach. And this statement over here is... It changed from a future tense, what we're going to do in the future, and it's a present tense. And also over here, this is, becomes a present tense. This prayer for the future is cut out, and this is made into present tense, and that's how we got to the combined bracha. And, of course, the Rambam, who was a Sephardi, calls himself, he was born in Spain and came from a long line of Jews who lived in Spain, then says another bracha, for a second cup, gets his own bracha, and he drinks the second cup. According to the Shulchan Aruch and later Sephardic practice, 
there is no second bracha over here. There is no bracha brief yagafin or hagafin as they wrongly say on the second cup. They say that the blessing recited on the first cup, the cup of kiddush, covered this second cup. It's kind of interesting. Minag Ashkenaz and Minag is still, yeah, like the Rambam over here. Very interesting. There's a lot of Minhagam I pointed out to people. The Rambam says, here's how to do it, and he says, that's the Minog and Sfarad. And uh, turns out that Svardim don't do things like that anymore. Svardim became Kabbalists and not Svardim anymore, even if they claim they're Svardim. Okay, what are you going to do? Once again, say the bracha on Atila Sadaim and Otel Yadosh Nia. Okay? Wait a minute, why do I have to do that though? He washed once. The only reason a person would wash his hands again with the bracha is because he's been distracted and may have touched something. Yes, the answer is Shari Siach Tato Bishat Kriyanagada. It's assumed he sort of lost track of what he was doing. He would have touched something in the meantime while the entire time he was reading the Haggadah, which, by the way, could take hours. And he takes two rikikin. That means uh, two cakes of matzah. Uh, what does a rakik mean? Like the Rambam says in a few places, Rashi says, and like Uclus translates, rakik means thin bread but spongy. And Rama says, by the way, that's how we make our matzah. Remember, once again, years ago, someone went to say, see, the Rama says we make rakik, which means thin crackers. No, it means thin spongy. Okay, Sponginess is, the softness is a critical component of matzah. In the olden days, there was no havamina that you'd make your matzah so thin and so dry that it'd be a cracker because then you can't use it for making a kriyatah. And it's also perhaps not appetizing. Why would you do such a thing? The answer, you became Hasidish and some of your concern that any form of baking that allows it to have any form of moisture still in there might become plummet somehow. So you have to just basically completely dry out your food. Okay, you don't have to do that. Okay, and and he breaks one of them and puts the broken one into, into the whole one. Wow, this is a loaded Rambam. The Rambam has but two matzahs. Only two matzahs. What else do we have in here? Uh, or can one be careful the sands not, need not wash? The Rambam assumes that he does. That's what Rambam says. He's siach dato bishak kriyata ha'agadah. It's not the kriya did it, but he's siach dato. He got so involved in this, he's doing it right. That you know, moved the table, and there was all sorts of discussions. It took a while, so that's why it's, I don't think it's just the reading I got itself. If you're alone, maybe, but it's assumed that there's a group of people here. So the Rambam notices he has what we call yachats, but even here, the Rambam didn't make an exception. It said, Bismanazeh, not Bismanazeh. According to the Rambam, there is no yachats in the middle. It's not Kadesh, Urchats, Karpas, yachats, and then put away. Half of the this matzah for Nafi Komen. He doesn't have such a thing. Kava Chomer, we took this out, the Afi Komen, Yachatz, why? Because even according to those who are not the Rambam, they would say to do this Yachatz before Ma Magid, before reading the Haggadah, there is no reason anymore because there's no Afi Komen. They're not preparing Afi Komen. So everybody holds like the Rambam when you have Kor when Korm Pesach. He says, Maniach the Parus into the Shalem. How do you put bread into bread? Okay, imagine taking two matzahs, like uh, cracker matzahs, whatever you may have. You break one matzah, and then how do you put that matzah into another? And if you're talking about, let's say, a loaf of bread, break one loaf of bread, a plummet stick bread, you want to stick it into the other loaf of bread, how are you supposed to do that? This is only possible if you have a rakik, a bread that's flat, yet very soft. Because once you have a bread that's very flat and soft, and you break up one, you just put one on top of the other, and then you roll it. So now you have the broken one, or the one that's been ripped, within the one that is still whole. That's why it's very important to use Ricky King for this. Why does the Ramam do this? He makes the blessing, usual blessing, of bread before eating it. So why does he have to do this? Lechem Oni. Even though he had two whole matzahs, usual Lechem Mishneh, in order to accomplish one facet of Lechem Oni, poor man's bread, it can't be whole. So one of them is cut. Also, here, there's two where does he get the third matzah? The rabbi has a sure about that, an old classic one, the mystery of the third matzah. Oh. I remember uh, my grandfather, blessed memory, I think he gave some money to Camp Hask or Hadassah, one of those things. Those were his, his tzedakahs. And because of that, every year for quite a few years, I would get in the mail a new edition of Art Scrolls uh, Haggadah. But uh, not just the typical hard school Haggadah. It was one that was based on the Minhagim of a particular Rosh Hashiva. So they had the, the Anadodi, 
uh, Haggadah based on the teachings of uh, Rav Aaron Cutler, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, all the usual good Ashkenazic Russia yeshiva with the connection to America had their own Haggadah. And you can go see this. Yeah. Yeah, they're still yeah, in my parents' yeah. house, all these Haggadahs. And all these Russia yeshiva did like the Vilna Gon, and not like the Shulchan Archer and the Ramah. They all had only two matzahs. Okay, well attested. So this is, where is a 10-year-old you can see? Wait a minute. My Haggadah says take three matzahs, but everybody in the know still just uses two matzahs. So where did this third matzah come from? That's a good That's a good question. But it's a much later idea. Here, here's a here's a, another question coming in. Uh yeah, it's better that way. Okay. Yes. So why not Lechem Mishnah? Normally, the way Lechem Mishnah works on most Yom Tifs and Shabbos, by the way, is supposed to have two whole breads. Okay? Nemar, Lechem Oni. It's poor man's bread. Madar Kosholim Befrusa, Afkan Befrusa. Just like an Oni, a poor person, an Ani, sorry. An Ani only has poor bread. So it's already broken. He doesn't even have a whole loaf of bread to his name. So, so too, and as Rav Kapach and others point out, the Ramam seems to hold this din throughout Passover. Whenever a person's going to eat Lacha Mishnah on Passover, he's supposed to break one before the blessing. And then he is to sandwich the matzah and moror together. So, he takes his matzamar sandwich, dips it into the charoset, umareich, baruch atu Hashem al kinemel cholam, asher kinesham nisotav, we see one, ala achilaf, matzam, marim, vokhlam. First he said a mozi on the bread, and bread, the baruch on the bread covers the, the maror, the lettuce as it may be. And then he says the blessing, the combined blessing upon eating the matzah and the bitter herbs, and he eats them together. That's what Ram says. He can eat his matzah and his maror together. If he wants to eat the matzah in, on its own, the mamor of niatzmo, and then the maror on its own, he eats the maror first, the matzah first, and then eats the maror, each one with its own blessings. Now, we're going to see that the Rambam made the statement, eat them together, or eat them apart, is only when you actually have Korban Pesach on the table. They're both rabbinical, uh, biblical commandments. He is then going to eat the, from the Zevach, the Korban Chagiga. So he has to say a blessing on that. And by the way, point it out, just like Hagaf and other things, our tradition is that, just like in the Torah, when the word Zevach is at the end of the sentence, it becomes Zavach, so too with the Kamats, so too when you're saying the blessing, it should be Allah Hilat HaZavach. And that's the way we put it in Haggadah Pesach. I do not know why Makbili left it as Zevach with a single. Yeah. And then he first eats this Chagigar Arbasar, the other Korban. Okay? That goes before Korban Pesach. And he makes a blessing upon eating the Pasach, which is more than just any other Zevach. It's a Pesach. So also, once again, it's with the Kamats, according to the rules of grammar, and that's the way we have it. Well, Chel Migufo Shel Pesach, and he eats from the actual body of the Pesach. Take a piece of Korban Pesach and eat it. Congratulations, this is the mitzvah we're all looking forward to. Velo Birkata Pesach, Poteret Shel Zevach. The blessing upon eating the Korban Pesach does not cover the one on the Chagiga. Velo Shel Zevach, Poteret Shel Pesach. And the one on this Chagiga over here, this other Zevach, uh, cover one for Pesach. <laughs> So this whole statement over here, Zion, is now going to be excluded by Chet. This was assuming there's Korm Pesach over here, this whole thing with the sandwich. Nowadays, after because we have no Korban, after he says the Bracha Motzilechem, he then says the blessing on eating the Matzah. He's not going to eat it with, with the with the Marah. With Tabel Matzah, the Charosa Velkel dips the matzah in some Charosa and eats it. That's unusual. The question is, you should you put, most people think, should you put salt on your matzah? That's the question. In this case, the Ram is assuming, no, you're supposed to put Charosa on the matzah. Charosa isn't just for, as some understanding of art, it's not just for Moror, it's for Karpas and it's for the, the, the matzah. Okay. And then he says the blessing on Plan Edi Moror. And then he dips his Moror in some Charosa and eats. And he shouldn't keep it in the charoses too much, otherwise he'll ruin the taste of the moror. Remember, like we saw previous weeks, each 
food stuff has to take like, taste like it's supposed to taste. The Zem Mitzvah is the base of free. Eating the Mara now, and the Charo says, that's just the rabbinic commandment. He said before, there's no independent biblical commandment to eat Mara if there is no Korban Pesach. But Chazal instituted it anyway. And then he makes a sandwich of Matzah Mara, and then dumps that, dips that in Charo says, and eats that zechel mikdash. How is this a zechel mikdash? If he does that korm pesach, how is he eating a sandwich zechel mikdash? Because if there was a mikdash, he would be eating matzah and mar together. Wait a minute, Hillel didn't Hillel make a sandwich? Most of the Rambam says it's like Hillel. If you do like Hillel, Hillel made a sandwich pesach matzah and mar. He also put pesach in there, and like we saw in the Rishami, Rabbi Yochanan says you can't do like Hillel. You shouldn't do like Hillel because then. Everything's canceling each other out. You're not tasting anything. The only thing that's allowed is eating matzah and mora together. That's according to all the chachamim except for Hillel, and the halacha follows them. That's what the Rambam says. You could technically, if you have kum pesach, now the maror is a mitzvah de raisa. You can combine matzah and mora and eat them together, or you can eat them separately. When you don't have kum pesach, you cannot combine them. You eat each one separate, and then you do a zikr like you used to do, a second eating of both together. But that's not the main act of eating. How uh, many The answer is over here one, one kazayas of maror, of one kazayas of matzah, one kazayas of maror, and yet another kazayas of matzah and maror in the sandwich. Two kazayasim of each. There's a later idea that he needs two kazayasim of matzah. Why? One for motzi, one's for matzah. One to one for the act of eating, and one for the act of the mitzvah of eating matzah. Which is kind of strange. The Ram would tell you. So when you say kiddish, you have to have one for the. You have to have one revius in your cup for drinking because you say boy priagafen, and you have to drink a certain amount of wine, and another for the mitzvah of kiddish. So al yai, which is zochar shiyom shabbos the kadsho. No, he could. He's killing two birds with one stone. So two, one kazais of moror, uh, one kazais of matzah covers his obligation to eat some bread upon saying the blessing of eating bread. And also the mitzvah of eating matzah. Makes sense? Good. So uh, let's see over here. So the Zeich Lamikdash aspect has nothing to do with Hillel, according to the Ramam. When he eats his sandwich of matzah and marah, when he has no korban pesach, it's Zeich Lamikdash because in the mikdash he would be eating the matzah and marah together, usually, or at least before the pesach. Al matzot yochiluhu. That, uh, I guess. The, the preposition there, upon matzah and moror, he shall eat. The Korm Pesach, what does it mean upon? Not literally. Hillel took it literally. In this case, it means along with. Okay? Someone should have, accompanying his Pesach, he should first have some matzah and moror. What the Rambam says here applies even when whether Korban Pesach or not. And he should eat whatever he wants to eat. He could drink whatever he wants to drink, Coca-Cola or even more wine. This is important because technically speaking, Chazal said four cups of wine. Normally when Chazal give us a number, there's four of something, five of something, it's to exclusion of other numbers. No more, no less. But in this case, when we say four cups of wine, or fifth cup as it may be, the Raman's going to mention, uh, technically speaking, during the middle of his meal, the the counter is off. If he has a few more cups of wine, it's fine. Just don't get too shikers so you'll be able to you know, complete the Seder uh, or drink whatever else is kosher for Pesach, as it may be. The very last thing, eat a kazayat of Korm Pesach, or at least just a little bit, a filu kazayat. That's enough. Remember, going to the Rambam, all these cases, eat a kazayat, it's not a challenge. Nowadays, like they give out charts and all that. Like someone was giving out a shul just before. Here's how much you're going to have to eat. It's a challenge. You have a certain amount of time to eat each thing. A, k- a kazayas is this much, this many grams, 50 grams of matzah. So you're going to have to choke that down somehow. And uh, that's not the Ram saying. When the Ram says it, he's saying it's so easy. It's so easy to accomplish an act of eating. It's just a kazayas. And he's not supposed to eat anything else. Wow. Okay. That was the last thing he eats is the corn pesach. If he wants to have a dessert-like thing, so he should do it before the Korm Pesach. If he wants to eat some you know, apple pie and some chocolate pudding, kosher for Pesach apple pie, of course. Okay, or some chocolate cake. Remember, 
If the rule is, if you're going to make a cake, it has to be chocolate. If you're going to eat a pie, it should be apple. If you eat cookies, it should be chocolate chip. Everything else is sacrilegious. So this should be the last thing. And nowadays, no Korban Pesach replaced with the Kazais of Matzah. And that's the last thing you should eat. Interesting enough, we have spent a lot of time explaining what does this accomplish? If there's no corn pesach to replace it with a piece of matzah, how does matzah replace corn pesach? And usually you don't have replacements for korbanos. Maybe we learn about korbanos, but it's very strange. Then what does the matzah accomplish? It's not corn pesach. Why eat that last? And the box said it's a mitzvah ika, so it's still a, a mitzvah also, and a mitzvah of consumption. So see the introduction of Agarah Pesach for this explanation. Kadesh Yev Seik Sudato Betam Besar Pesach Wa Matzah Befiv. Point is, when he finishes the meal, the last thing he tastes is Besar Pesach or the Matzah in his mouth, Shachil Atani Mitzvah. Because their consumption, that's the mitzvah. Okay, why not Moro or that? Why not Haros says? Question. So Chazal institute this matzah here, perhaps the institution of eating the afikomen, that this will be called the afikomen, perhaps it's even biblical. I don't know. Uh, what we do see here is, though, this doesn't mean that a person, let's say, cannot floss, which is very important if you're going to eat a meal of meat. If you want to keep your teeth, one of the best ways to prevent cavities is by flossing or even brushing your teeth. This doesn't mean that one has to keep himself feeling like that was in, that that's still in his mouth. It's not about a hygiene. Rather, it means the last thing he ate, he feels it. The last thing he ate, and he'll, he'll taste it, and it's, it's in his belly. That should, <laughs> that should be Korban Pesach that night, or it should be the Afi Koban, as we call it. But it doesn't mean he has to have this stuff physically remaining in his mouth. Uh, let's see here. They wash his hand again. Why does the Rambam say that? Because the Rambam holds that my wrote him. Uh, washing hands after meal is even if one doesn't have necessarily the salt, okay? the Sodom salt. Point this out over here. I guess we'll close with this one. Here, this is a very interesting Rambam. This is your mind, Mahronim. This is my Mishonim, Itamu, see that. Machurim, Shalir, Shi, Ashpil Yadav, Vamata, Kadeshi, Klay, say, Koach, Amelech, Shal Yadav. Okay? He's supposed to get all the salt off his hands. It says here, to read this, I should have made a note. It says in the third halacha, in the sixth parak of the Suda, the Rambam says, Palitha Melach, person was measuring out the salt. It means he got salt in his hands. Certainly, Tilat Yadayim Bachrona. He should wash his hands afterwards. Shema Yishbo Melach Stomito, Melach Shativo Keteva Melach Stomit. Lest there be salt on his hands. Okay. Now, or something similar to that. Then he'll touch his hands and he'll blind himself. That's why they said you have to wash your hands after every single meal. Why? But he still has to do what soldiers don't have to wash the first wash. They, it's too much of a trouble for them. They're out in the field, in the war. 
but they still have to wash their hands afterwards because of the salt. So Ramam assumes they always have salt like that, so you always have to wash their hands. The others who would say that not necessarily there's uh we don't have salt anymore. We don't use that type of thing. Maybe you have meals where there's no chance you're going to blind yourself. So you don't have my machronim is not necessarily an obligation. Okay. No tell I don't right be kind of my zone. I'll coach the shiva show take him. He says the blessing after the meal, usual one, of course, with the and they drink the third cup. Okay. Does the Ramamir say there's a brach on the third cup? Well, usually he doesn't mention explicitly, but everybody agrees that there has to be. If a person says the, the blessing, uh, on a cup of wine, so he's supposed to say he's supposed to say the brach of Bray and also upon that. Now, we saw earlier, assuming it's not the Seder, and there's no obligation of this third cup with Birkat Amazon, does one need a cup for Birkat Amazon? So the Rambam says it's never an obligation. Whereas others say, it's really what you're supposed to do, even if you have a Zima, one person on his own is supposed to have a cup. Okay. Okay. And then he pours the fourth cup, the Gomer of Italia. Notice the Rambam didn't mention, by the way, is this practice that everybody pours for each other. Okay. That's a, not a requirement. It's not something that's universal. Not saying that it's all necessarily said. Okay. Uh, and then he he finishes the Halel. This finishing the Halel is a loaded term also. Why? Because normally it means saying the complete Halel. But in this case, it really means he's Finishing what he didn't say. Remember, he already said two par paragraphs of the Halil. We will love Birkat Ashir. They're supposed to say Birkat Ashir. What is Birkat Ashir? Oh, that's also a major machlokas. Uh, is it what we call Nishmas? Or is it that bracha that normally is after Halil on days when we say the Halil, Yahalulucha? Rama says it is Yahalulucha. Some say it's a combination thereof. And once he drinks the fourth fourth cup after the Halel and this version of Birkat Ashir, so that's it. He can only drink water. I hope he's eaten enough that he doesn't feel like he has to eat something else anyways after that. Oh, wait, he can do a fifth cup. This is a good one. And upon that, he recites the paragraph known as Halel Gadol, Psalm 136. It's from the Hodu Lashem Kitov until Al Naroth Bavel. He doesn't say this first verse over here. Just saying that that's what it is. It consists of that. This fifth cup is not an obligation. Like the first four. Who does the fifth cup? I've seen people do this. We included it in the Haggadah. Rabbi Rosen recommended doing it. Rabbi Kasher also said it's a good thing. It's, uh, I guess, the type of people who are into wanting to bring Korm Pesach are also the type who have a fifth cup. He could say halal wherever he wants. Why is this important? Because earlier the Rambam said, for most of the city, you got to stay put. You can't start switching around groups and switching locations because each group, even the Korn Pesach, has its own defined mechitzas. Either it's its own room, and if it's not sharing a room with other groups, they have to actually build a physical barrier Machlokas, what they very consist of, but there's supposed to be a separation between the two groups. But in this case, they could leave the house, they could go on to the rooftops as they want, recombine groups once the once the Birkatama zone is over. Even though it's not the place where they had the meal, it's not the place to form Pesach. We're done with form Pesach. Now they could go sing Halel. I've never seen people do this before, though. Even with Seder's Dab Kom Pesach. Maybe once, if some people get together and say, "Hall, people who didn't have their seders together, they said the halal themselves in different groups." Place where people have a uh, practice, they eat roasted meat. Well, in the night of Passover, so they can. In a place where there's a practice not to eat roasted meat, they don't. Lest they say it's Pesar Pesach. Like I said earlier, everybody has agrees that they should not be eating roasted lamb or roasted goat. That's already too far. The question was, what about other meats? So that depends on local practice. Uh, but anyway, wherever you are, can't eat a roasted set, can't eat a roasted lamb this night. Because that looks like you're eating sacrificial meat beyond the temple. 
That's it was cut up. If it's cut up, it looks like remember you're not supposed to cut the corn pez up certain ways, it would break the bones. Or he's leaving part of it out. Part of it's missing. Oh shalak bo evar bar. There's part of it that looks like it's cooked to show that this is not a roasted pom pesach. So that is permissible in places where that is their practice. But the Ramah said, doesn't say do that. Okay, So we don't have, the reason this is forbidden for us is because no one does this such a day, no one practices. I think this middog basically went the way of the dodo. And if you don't have corn pesach, you're not supposed to have any roasted meat. That's the way we were brought up. You have a question? So apparently it's a Tosefus mitzvah over here. Right. Remember, on, he's already had two cups of wine after the afikol and after the korban pesach, so it's not going to change the taste in his mouth. So just more wine. What about bal tosif? Isn't the bal tosif? No, it's not a mitzvah de raisa. It's a mitzvah de rabbanon. So there's no bal tosif that governs mitzvah de rabbanon. Uh, so here he has here. I guess we'll we'll take a break for now. Another question coming in. I don't know. Are you that hungry after a fast? Assuming you're a firstborn, um, a sixth cup. Can you drink a sixth cup? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think you can have a sixth cup. I'll just tell you why. All the cups that we're drinking on at, at the Seder are attached to a mitzvah. Kiddush, so that comes to the cup. Haggadah and Gal Yisrael, that comes to the cup. Birkasa Mazon, yeah, that comes to the cup of wine. Say, recitation of Halal, that has its cup. So you say Halal that's a cup. Upon what are you going to drink your sixth cup? There's no other hollow you could say. You're going to read Shirashirim. There's no brother. There's no Shirashirim is not accompanied by a cup of wine. So there's no there's no excuse for a sixth cup. Just if you want a sixth cup, just make sure that your cup for the fifth cup is extra big. Notice also, uh, this is similar to the practice of the Kos Shaliyahu, which the Rambam doesn't mention. Not everybody has such a thing. Uh, and they... The scholars I pointed out there perhaps there's a connection. The fifth cup was a cup for Eliola and Navi. So I've seen people have this really big Kiddush cup they use for Kosh Eliyahu. They pour in like three, four bottles of wine. Why are they doing that? I think it's wasteful. But that's Eliyahu's cup. But then they use that for Kiddush the next morning. So if you want to have extra wine after your Seder, so make sure your fifth cup is extra big and then you'll you know be able to cover your bases. Okay. Um I think that covers everything. I'd like to wish everybody a good Shabbos and hope uh, I hope to see you uh, later this next week, Monday afternoon in Jerusalem, ready for Korban Pesach. It should be this year. After all, what did we say last year? Shana Bab Yerushalayim. I ask people, what did you mean when you said that? Now, so many people make plans not to be around in Yerushalayim for Pesach. So were they lying when they said at the Seder? What were they thinking? Yeah, at least we should have in our hearts and our mouths. That means what we really think inside and what we actually say, they should have some correspondence. Be well. Shalom and Yisachon. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.